everyone. Um, Secretary Timmy, could you call the roll? Uh, Regent Bartel. Here. Regent Bradley. Here. Regent Conley Kiesler. Here. Regent Crane. Here. Uh, Regent Davis. Here. Regent Danae Davis. Two She's, here. She's here. Okay, and Regent Stan Davis. Okay. Regent Drew. Here. Regent Evers. Here. Regent Salbo. Here. Regent Loftus. Here. Regent Opkinor. Here. Regent Pruitt. Here. Uh, Regent Smith. Here. Regent Spector. Here. Regent Vasquez. Here. Regent Walsh. Here. Regent Wingett. Here. Regent Womack. A quorum is present. Thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome some new colleagues to the Board of Regents. Uh, first of all, I'm very pleased to welcome Tony Evers, who took office as State Superintendent of Public Construction earlier this week. Uh, he was sworn in at High Mount School, and I know Mike Spector was there and asked to say a few words, and so <coughs> Regent Spector. Thank you. One of the great benefits of being retired is you can go to all these events. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to Tony's swearing in at High Mount School, and I want to tell you what a terrific event <coughs> it was, not only for the substance of what Tony said in his acceptance speech and the swearing in by uh, the wife of one of our uh, board members, but the symbolism of doing it in Milwaukee and doing it at a school that uh, uh, started in 1914 <coughs> and using as a big part of his acceptance speech the creed of the school from 1932 and playing on that going forward as events have changed in Milwaukee and things have changed. So I commend Tony greatly. It was pointed out there that he grew up in Plymouth, <coughs> Wisconsin, that he's a graduate of the UW system, particularly Madison, and uh, has had great experience in the K-12 school districts of our state in numerous capacities, uh, principal, superintendent, uh, and other things. So I think it's a wonderful thing that Tony is here, and the way he did his acceptance was just terrific for Milwaukee and the K-12 school districts, and I know he will contribute greatly to the higher education as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Tony, welcome. Also joining us is new Regent Stan Davis, um, who will succeed Regent Mary Keene. Uh, Stan is a partner at Axley Brinlinson here in Madison, where he serves as co-chair of the Government Relations Group. Prior to joining the law firm, he served as Governor, as Governor Doyle's Deputy Chief of Staff and Legal Counsel. Stan received his bachelor's degree from UW La Crosse and his JD from George Washington University Law School. Welcome, Stan. Thank you. Bye. Mr. President, I, yes. you forgot to mention that Regent Davis began his career at the law firm of Quarles and Brady. <laughs> <laughs> okay, got it. Did he spend any time at Foley and Larner? <laughs> um, uh, also, welcome also to Aaron Wingott, who was with us uh, last month, uh, but is our now new student regent from Eau Claire. Aaron is majoring in biochemistry and molecular biology. He plans to attend medical school after graduation. Aaron, welcome, and as a reward, one of your, as your, one of your first votes, you will get the opportunity to vote on the tuition rates. <laughs> welcome, Aaron. Uh, uh, President Pruitt, I wanted to add my uh, personal welcome, too, to uh, Regent Evers and Regent Wingat and Regent uh, Davis. And, uh, I wanted you to know that uh, Regent Davis has informed me that when he was in the governor's office, he was involved in uh, close vetting of region appointments, and I've decided I will be getting very close to Regent Davis. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we have to talk. Um, thank you. Um, the minutes of the June 4th and 5th, 2009 meetings have been distributed. Are there any additions or corrections? If not, uh, they will stand approved. Um, we now have a resolution of appreciation, and I would like to call on Regent Bradley to read that resolution. Thank you, 
as Regent Davis would say, good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> There's two Davises now, so people are going to get so confused. I think they all, but when I'm speaking about Regent Davis, I think people are going to know who I'm talking about. <laughs> I think some people who look at the Board of Regents um, draw to mind Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid in that movie when Paul, uh, Robert Redford would periodically look at Paul Newman and out at that posse that was relentlessly chasing them and say, who are those guys? <laughs> and when people ask that about us as regents, I don't think they really are inquiring about who we are as individuals. I think the question is more of, uh, does that person understand me? Does that, can that person relate to my situation? Does that person care? Well, if people ask those questions of me, there isn't anyone I would rather be standing next to than Mary Keene. Students, of course, always question whether regents are even remotely connected to their lives. And I think that students are comforted and they're maybe even delighted to learn that Mary understands everything in their world because, not only because of her children, but also because she's immersed in their world. In fact, I think if a student was talking to one of us and would say, do you understand what it's like in the trenches? Mary Keene could look at him and say, sweetheart, I dug those trenches. <laughs> Mary Keene can relate to undergraduate students, to graduate students, to transfer students, to working students. She can relate to students in the UW system. She can relate to students in the Wisconsin Technical College system. In fact, Mary Keene is one of the few people who can even relate to a student who shows up registering for classes in their freshman year and is pregnant. Mary can relate to faculty because she is a member of the faculty. She can relate to community needs because she is very involved in her community. In fact, Mary Keene was a community organizer before anyone ever heard of Barack Obama. <laughs> this is true. This is true. You know this. This is true. Uh, Mary came to the Board of Regents as a recognized leader, not only in her community, but in state labor organizations, in her political party, at her college and in the technical college system as a whole. And it all started because someone cared. A wise lawyer in Green Bay looked at this young, talented, energetic paralegal and said, you should go on. You should do more. You should go on and get your university education. And Mary did. And Mary Keene repays that debt thousands of times when she teaches in her classes, when she's involved in her community, when she's involved in higher education, encouraging students all the time, do more, do better, do more for us in addition to just doing more for yourself. In fact, I think if there was ever an autopsy done on Mary Keene, <laughs> everyone would step back and say, son of a gun, she's all heart. <laughs> And not only all heart, but also a person of good humor. A couple of years ago, I was at UW Parkside, and I was talking to a student leader, and he said, you know, you're the third regent I've met. And you talk about you know, the tuition and enrollment trends and budget. He said, do you guys ever just sit back and have fun? And I said, you haven't met Regent King yet, have you? <laughs> so it is with a... Great deal of pleasure that I read the resolution that we have recognizing Mary Keene for her service. Whereas Mary Keene has dedicated three years of exemplary service as a regent of the University of Wisconsin system from 2006 to 2009, whereas Mary has maintained the strong tradition of working together with the Wisconsin Technical College system to increase access to higher education, including expanded transfer opportunities for all students and support and guidance to help adult students understand the options available to earn a four-year degree as part of the UW System Adult Student Initiative. And whereas Mary has been personally committed to providing educational access to Wisconsin students regardless of location, 
including teaching the first distance learning course that originated from Northeast Wisconsin Technical College's Green Bay campus, and whereas her participation on the board's education committee has helped maintain the high quality academic programs for which UW institutions are known, and whereas Mary is a proud alumna of two UW system institutions, having received her Bachelor's of Science degree from UW Green Bay and her Master's degree from UW Milwaukee, and whereas she has helped guide the direction of two UW institutions through her service on special chancellor search committees for UW Green Bay and the current chancellor search for UW Platteville, and whereas Mary has affirmed the Wisconsin Technical College System's role as a key partner in increasing the diversity of the UW System student body to reflect the broad spectrum of the state's residents. So be it therefore resolved that the Board of Regents of the University of Wisconsin System commends Mary Keene for her distinguished and dedicated service on behalf of higher education in Wisconsin, signed by Charles Pruitt, President of the UW Board of Regents. such a great, great pleasure to serve with all of you, my region colleagues on the Board of Regents and the chancellors and all the provosts and all the UW staff. Thank you so much for all of your um, help and advice and smile. Okay. So it seems like it's just like a blink of an eye. Three years have already passed. Um, representing the Wisconsin Technical College System Board of Directors and the Board of Regents has indeed been a great honor, a privilege, and experience I will never forget. Um, you see, my family has a history of serving on school boards. Um, both my grandfather and my dad played important roles during transformations in the East De Pierce School District. Um, my grandfather serving in the 60s when some of you may recall all the school district boundaries were changed. <coughs> and um, my dad worked really hard in the 70s and 80s to get a new high school built in East Pier. So in a way, you see, it was only just a matter of time until it was my turn to carry on the family tradition. And so I have. Now, um, while one of the schoolhouses are having revival in Montana, there are not many of us left in Wisconsin who today began their formal education in a one schoolhouse. I can uh, tell you I was fortunate to have the opportunity to go through fifth grade at Conrad School, which was south of De Pere, and I relished every minute. My self-esteem just grew tremendously during this period because I was always number one in my class. Uh, there were only three people in my class, <laughs> but I was number one, so you know, that's pretty cool when you're in first grade and second grade. And, um, so by the time I was in second grade, I was already tutoring first graders and in first, second grade, in third grade, tutoring the second graders. And so already at that time, my love for education and teaching had begun that early in my life. Now, as uh, Regent Bradley mentioned, I am a proud alum of UW Green Bay, taking over 10 years, going part time as a returning adult student to graduate, over 10 years. <laughs> Yes, um, it, it was a wonderful interdisciplinary education that I received there, and it's made all the difference in my life. One service to the university in particular, which ma made my obtaining of a degree go from a dream to reality, was the UWGB Children's Center. Um, you know, I was a returning adult student working with children, um, as are many of our students today, and, and I do relate to those students, as Mark mentioned. Um, so both of my sons are proud grads of UWGB Preschool. <laughs> <laughs> a 
Ashley, uh, sadly, but necessarily, that building was torn down a number of years ago. And so, Chancellor Harden, you probably don't know this yet, but you're the only comprehensive that does not offer child care for students. And, <laughs> and so, uh, so I, and I hope my regent colleagues um, that I leave this with you, that you will support returning children child care services to UW Green Bay. It really made a difference for me and I know for a lot of people at that time. So I leave you with that challenge. And, um, and my master's degree was made possible by a program at UW-Milwaukee School of Education, um, which offered many graduate classes to a cohort of students in the Fox River Valley by sending the professors to us rather than us traveling to them. Now at that time it was kind of a pioneer program. Uh, before the days of online learning and accelerated classes and the like, making it possible for working adults to advance their degrees without spend, spending inordinate amounts of windshield time. With that in mind, my regent colleagues, I urge you to continue to support options for learners throughout Wisconsin, options that are affordable, options that are relevant, and options that are non-duplicative. It is more important today than ever before in our state's fine history to advance public higher education opportunities for all learners. <clears throat> and um, as many of you know, increasing the ease with which students can transfer credits from the Wisconsin Technical College system to the UW system has been paramount on my mind through my time with you, the Regents. In the last three years, both CDTC and WTC have had transfer de degrees approved. UWGB launched a new four-year degree which accepts all associate degrees, and UW Oshkosh has begun a similar program. All of these are important strides forward at a time when Wisconsin ranks eighth in producers of two-year degrees and yet 33rd in producers of four-year degrees. So now is the time to continue these types of initiatives, making it possible for our technical college graduates to continue their education, obtain advanced degrees, and further their careers without delay, without repeating courses, and without spending time and money unnecessarily. And so, on that editorial note, my friends, <laughs> I will bid you adieu with the words of one of my favorites, Garrison Keeler, who every morning ends the Writer's Almanac with, <clears throat> be well, do good work, and keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Bradley. Thank you, Regent Emeritus Keene. Um, and with uh, Madam Secretary, if we can show that that resolution was approved by acclamation. I now turn to another resolution of appre appreciation appropriately delivered by Regent Hopkins. Thank you, Regent Bradley. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. As a veteran, I appreciate the value and uh, I, I appreciate and value great officers who lead from the front. People who not only know the mission, but have the ability to instill trust and confidence in others so that everyone embraces the shared commitment to success. Chancellor David Marquis is that kind of leader, a genuine student-centered chancellor. Students recognize that he is a very pleasant person who will talk to you about anything with a calm demeanor. In addition, every decision that Chancellor Marquis makes, he keeps students' interests in the forefront, asking how will this affect the students and how will this enhance their educational experiences. Chancellor Marquis is a regular at all sorts of student activities and functions. He not only attends almost every home game for every intercollegiate team, he has also been known to observe a few of the team practices. He attends concerts, recitals, student theater, theatrical performances. He participates in student forums, roundtables, student-sponsored events, and respects the student opinions that come out of the shared governance process. Chancellor Marquis is our biggest UW Platteville cheerleader, encouraging students to be more involved and more active, often citing the difference in academic 
success between students who are active members of campus community and those who take a more passive role. Chancellor Marquis has provided strong leadership for new initiatives that reflect his student focus. One of the most, one of the most visible examples of his student focus is the new Student Center, which provides opportunities for students. <coughs> Chancellor Marquis was one of the first people to realize that the campus needed a new Student Center. He worked tire tirelessly to make it happen. Similarly, he's, met, he's led many other improvements to the campus, including the addition of a new residence hall, improvements to Glenview Commons, and major improvements to various health and wellness areas, including the weight room track and our athletic fields. I should observe that every successful commanding officer has an equally effective XL or executive officer. With no disrespect to the UWP vice chancellors, I'm referring to Luann Marquis. A UWP graduate, Luann Marquis has been Chancellor Marquis's partner in transforming the campus, serving as the interior designer for many new campus spaces in selecting, the wall, in selecting the wall, floor, and ceiling finishes along with the furniture and cabinetry to, rem to remember the customers, making it contemporary, tasteful selections that would appeal to students and ensure, ensure maximum use of the new facilities. David and Luann Marquis are always ready to share their pioneer proud with others. Today, I'm proud to share this resolution. Resolution of Appreciation for Chancellor Marquis. Whereas, David Marquis has been one of the longest serving chancellors in the UW system, having dedicated more than 13 years in service as the 13th Chancellor of the University of Wisconsin Platteville from 1996 to 2009. And, whereas, David has been the only chancellor in the UW system to be currently leading his alma mater and through his status as an alumnus has strengthened ties with the UW of Platteville nearly 46,000 alumni as well as the UW of Platteville Foundation and whereas under David's tenure UW of Platteville has seen tremendous expansion in the student enrollment and has been the fastest growing UW campus over the past decade with the student body expanding by an impressive 46 percent since 1998 and whereas David's legacy includes an improved campus infrastructure, including major re renovations to Russell Hall, Ulrich Hall, the Art Building, Alswick Hall, Glenview Commons, and Williams Fieldhouse, as well as new construction of the Pioneer Student Center, a suite styled resident hall, an engineering building, the greenhouse and the garden complex, and four facilities at the Pioneer Farm, reflecting his commitment to a high caliber learning experience for all students, and Whereas, through his commitment to academic and professional excellence, David has encouraged development of a web-based academic degree programs, establishment of exchange partner and other international programs, including the foundation of the Confucius Institute at UW Platteville, enhancement of student support services such as advising, counseling and tutoring, establishment of the first year experience program and Pioneer Academic Center for Community Engagement, and the development of a 10-year plan to increase campus diversity. And whereas David's vision for the campus has a powerful, far-reaching impact on Southwest Wisconsin and the tri-state region, reinvigorating the pioneer community and making it a hub of lear learning, research, and economic development. Be it therefore resolved that the Board of Regents of the UW system hereby commend David Marquis for his many life achievements, offer him thanks for his Longtime service as Chancellor of UW Platteville and wishes him well in his retirement endeavors. Signed, Charles Pruitt, President of the UW System Board of Regents.
Thank you. Um, I'll just take a moment. Um, I had some prepared remarks, but I lost them. <laughs> I, really, I really do want to uh, thank you, Kevin, for those kind words. And they mean a lot to me, coming from you as our student region and Blackville student region as well. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Catherine Lyle, who hired me, and Kevin, who continued my employment <laughs> chancellor over this last 13 years. I've uh, had an opportunity to, to work in the system for a uh, quarter century, 25 years total out of the last 40 years in the Wisconsin system, either as being in the system either as a student, an employee, and then as chancellor the last 13 years. And it has been a pleasure. And uh, I was asked not too long ago if I could identify a couple things that I really didn't like. And I couldn't. I, there were moments, naturally, <laughs> and opportunities, <laughs> reactions, and different things. But overall, I, I can't. I really can't. I can honestly say this has been a pleasure. Um, my relationship with the regents and their leadership my fellow chancellors, uh, the administrative team at Platteville, and Carol Sue will be ably moving forward in that role, and uh, also uh, all the faculty and staff and student leaders that we've had both on our campus and I've had the pleasure of working across the system with. It's been a real pleasure, and I do mean that. And Luann was going to come with me this morning, but chickened out at the last minute. And uh, she was with us last night, as you know, but uh, um, she feels the same way. It's, uh, it's been a partnership and a pleasure for both of us, and thank you all. Um, it means a lot, and thank you. And I just wanted to add that on the recommendation of his colleagues at the Platteville campus, I have designated David Marquis Chancellor Emeritus at UW Platteville. <laughs> Secretary, if we can indicate that that resolution was also approved by acclamation. Uh, a resolution of appreciation for UW Parkside Interim Chancellor Lane Earns is in your folders. This resolution will be approved by acclamation as well. I wanted to just take just one moment to especially thank uh, Lane uh, for your leadership. You took over at a challenging and, and interesting time at UW Parkside and, and led that institution with great wisdom, great energy, uh, great dedication. Uh, thank you, and good luck with that co-chancellorship at UWI. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Lane. Um, while we're on the subject of paying tribute to people who've made uh, many important contributions to UW system, I also want to extend our appreciation and best wishes to Cheryl Goplin, who is retiring next month after working at UW system administration for 29 years, 19 of those years in the board office. In addition to her many other duties, Cheryl has served as Assistant Secretary of the Board for almost nine years. In fact, as you may recall, we just re-elected her and Judy Temby uh, to these posts last month. Uh, this election immediately followed the elections of the President and Vice President of the Board, so it only took Regent Specter and I three weeks to chase away 58 years. <laughs> I think this is the definition of off to a rocky start. Uh, in any event, we want to thank you, Cheryl, uh, for all your hard work and dedication. We wish you all the best in your time. I'll just say it's been an honor and a privilege for me to serve you. And uh, system, and especially Judy Timby. I want to say a special thanks. Thank you. Um, yes. Sure. Yeah. 
Thanks. Uh, I just uh, asked uh, Regent Pruitt if I could take a, a minute before we get into the uh, substance of today's meeting to introduce uh, three new provosts in the system who are with us uh, today. Uh, first, uh, uh, Fernando Delgado, who is the new provost at UW River Falls. Fernando is back there. Welcome. <laughs> Provost Delgado comes to us having been most recently the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts at uh, Hamlin University in St. Paul and prior to joining Hamlin he held positions as Dean in the College of Graduate Studies and Research at Minnesota State University Mankato and Associate Vice Provost of Academic Programs at Arizona State University. He earned his MA and PhD, degree, PhD degrees in Communication Studies from the University of Iowa and a BA degree in political science from San Jose State University. So we're delighted to have you with us, Fernando. Uh, second, uh, at Eau Claire, the new uh, provost is also with us today, and that is uh, Dr. Pat Patricia Klein. Uh, Dr. Klein, and Provost Klein. <laughs> Klein uh, comes to us uh, having been Dean of the School of Education and Professional Studies at Eastern Connecticut State University in uh, Wilmantic, Connecticut. From 89 to 95, she taught in the Department of Educational uh, Leadership at Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio. She served as chair of that department from 1995 to 1998, and earlier in her career, Klein taught and served as a principal and interim superintendent at public schools in Colorado, Kansas, and Maine. Uh, she holds a bachelor's degree in elementary education from the University of Northern Colorado and earned a doctorate in higher education and research statistics from the University of Maine in Orono. So welcome, Provost Klein. Thirdly, uh, recently appointed as interim provost at the University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point is uh, Jeffrey uh, Morin. Uh, Jeff is here with us. Jeff, welcome. Jeff uh, most recently served as Dean of Stevens Point uh, College <coughs> of Fine Arts and Communication. He joined that campus in 1996 as a faculty member in the Department of Art and Design. He served as chair of that department from 2000 until 2005 when he was appointed Dean. Jeff received his Master of Fine Arts and Master of Arts degrees from UW-Madison after having earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the Tyler School of Arts at Temple University. He was a faculty member at the University of Tennessee Chattanooga from 1988 to 1996 and helped that institution to create its graphic design program. So welcome, Jeff. Welcome to the job. Uh, and then I wanted to note uh, the departure of, of uh, two interim provosts. This will be their last, uh, last region meeting in these roles. Uh, first, I'll mention uh, interim provost at UWGB, Bill Lotch. Bill is over here with us. Thank you for your service, Bill. <laughs> Bill's going back happily to retirement uh, after we pulled him out of it, and uh, he and uh, uh, David J. Ward did a great job, I think, in, uh, in uh, keeping things moving forward at Green Bay and awaiting the arrival of Chancellor Hart, who's now here, and we're, we're delighted. So thank you. And uh, at UW-Madison, Julie Underwood, this will be her last meeting as the interim provost of Madison. <laughs> thank you for your service, Julie. And uh, Julie will be going back to be dean of the School of Education, a very well-regarded school at uh, UW-Madison. So we appreciate your service. All right. President yeah. Riley. Yes. There's one more interim ah. provost who is is stepping out of that role, okay. and that's um, Interim Provost Al Hartman at yeah. UW Oshkosh. Ah. And we thank him for his service. Ah. Thank you for reminding me, and thank you for your, your service, Al. Appreciate it. With that, Mr. President, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Um, just a word or two in, in introduction to our topic today uh, for this morning's session, which is the UW System Role in Workforce Development. Uh, normally, as, as many of you know, and a few of our new colleagues will now learn, um, we have used these one-day meetings to allow the board to engage in a bit of blue sky thinking, stepping back from the pressure of making specific decisions to analyze broader or more strategic topics. 
Today, uh, we are what in what one could call a hybrid meeting. Uh, this afternoon, we'll take up a couple of individual committee items, as well as uh, tackling the very substantial action item as we look at the annual operating budget for 2009 and 10. This morning, we take the opportunity to look at a critically important uh, strategic policy item, which is workforce development. Clearly, the University of Wisconsin has longstanding leadership role in this area, and the Board of Regents has, both historically, and I think we're all in agreement today and going forward, needs to continue to demonstrate leadership uh, on this important question. Uh, one of our jobs, I think, is to participate and lead the conversation on the role of the university in meeting the wider economic needs of the state, the nation, and indeed the world. Um, as a citizen board, particularly, I think we, we have sitting around this table people with a broad range of experiences in both the private and the public sectors who can um, play an important role in that conversation. Just a, mo a, a word about history. Um, we, the Board of Regents did that uh, especially aggressively a few years ago under the leadership of Board President Jay Smith uh, who when we sponsored a series of statewide economic summits. Uh, we've done that most recently by working with President Riley to advance the growth agenda in all its components. Today, in tough economic times like these, it's more important than ever to ensure that our public university is taking a hard look at the public's workforce needs. Our efforts in that area of producing educated workers and growing the innovation economy jobs to employ them will play a key role in Wisconsin's long-term <laughs> economic recovery and growth, which cannot come soon enough. Uh, so with that, let me turn it over to President Riley, who will introduce this morning's presentation. Thank you, President Pruitt. I guess uh, you could say, in a way that, in the broadest sense, workforce development is what we do. Uh, as educators, we prepare our students to meet the future with knowledge and ingenuity and skills and confidence. And we are a large provider of new members of the workforce. And in 2008, the UW system produced a record 32,000 graduates. That's 32,000 students sent out into the world, most of whom stay right here in Wisconsin, who are well armed to be engaged, productive, and fulfilled citizens, as well as contributors to the success of the Wisconsin economy. This morning, we have the opportunity to look at the issue of workforce development and our role in that development in greater depth. And I think there are at least two ways to consider our contributions. Uh, that is, first, uh, meeting immediate workforce needs. What does the state need and where and how can that demand be best filled? Second, developing the workforce of the future. This means looking longer term and preparing for new jobs, new services, new industries, and a higher quality of life for more Wisconsinites in the decade ahead. The university's role in workforce development goes beyond educating students, of course. It also encompasses the work product, the innovative ideas, goods, and services generated by our faculty, staff, and students. The research being done on our campuses is involved in saving and improving lives and translates into business opportunities and new jobs. In February, this board heard a presentation by Tom Still, who, as you know, is president of the Wisconsin Technology Council, Tom put in perspective the very <laughs> significant role that academic research and development plays in Wisconsin's economy. As detailed in a Wisconsin Technology Council report, academic R&D is a $1.1 billion, $1.1 billion industry in Wisconsin, directly and indirectly driving the creation of more than 38,000 jobs in Wisconsin last year. Our UW <coughs> institutions clearly are the preeminent player in that arena. And that's something we should be very proud of. But we can and we must do more. As I think you'll recall, earlier this year, I created the Research to Jobs Task Force, explicitly charged with further developing that connection. In a few minutes, we'll hear from Carl Gobranson, the director of the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, or WARF, who agreed to lead the Research to Jobs Task Force. And Carl, I'm very grateful for your willingness to do that. Drawing on his unique perspective, Carl can further enlighten us on the challenges and payoffs in developing the workforce of the future. We're also privileged to have uh, other guests joining us this morning to share their insights on workforce issues. We invited Roberta Gassman, the Secretary of, of uh, Workforce Development for Wisconsin, to talk about the immediate and projected workforce needs of the state and the strategies in place to address them. 
Uh, Secretary Gassman is unable to be with us, something I think about uh, bringing a new grandchild into the workforce uh, that she's involved with. But uh, we're delighted that Deputy Secretary Joanna Richard is standing in for her. Welcome, Joanna. Also joining us is Kim, Kim Kinchy, who's Director of the Division of Entrepreneurship and Economic Development at UW <coughs> Extension. Through Extension's connections to every campus in the UW system, every county in the state, Kim works to make the whole of the university's contributions to economic and workforce development more than the sum of its parts. We all know that the 21st century innovation economy requires a highly skilled workforce. UW system institutions clearly have a significant role to play in helping to prepare that workforce, along with many, many partners. We work in what I'll call the short and middle distances with these partners, educating students for jobs that exist now uh, in the business and nonprofit <coughs> profit sectors, and for those jobs we believe, based on current trends, will be available in the decade or so ahead. We also educate our students and conduct our research for the long haul, pushing the envelope in ways that will create industries and jobs that have yet to be conceived. And that long haul is getting shorter all the time. That long haul is also the university's special province in workforce development. In today's discussion, you'll have the opportunity to learn more about what we're doing with our partners in supplying today's workforce needs and planning for those of the future. Through a set of big policy questions, we'll solicit your advice about our current activities and ask you to cast ahead with us about what we might do differently to be even more effective in this vital part of our mission. So to lead our discussion this morning, I want to turn the floor over now to, to Rebecca Martin, our Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs. Rebecca. Thank you, Kevin. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, as Kevin has indicated, the UW system has a fundamental role in developing the workforce for the state of Wisconsin. And from my perspective, I think that role is linked very directly to each of the three elements of the growth agenda. Produce more graduates, create more jobs, and enhance our communities. The workforce of Wisconsin is directly linked to each one of these. I think that many people in the state, when they think of workforce development, they think of the Wisconsin Technical Colleges, and they clearly have a very important role to play as well. But this is also an essential component of the UW system, and I know that all of our chancellors and provosts are very involved in workforce development. Um, when I was the provost at UW Parkside, I sat on the Racine Workforce Development Board. Our chancellors and provosts are doing that now. They're very actively involved in the regional economic development entities across the state, another very important link to the workforce development agenda. And so I think that what we are hoping to do now is to, to over the next um, several minutes, to share with you some examples of what we're doing and as well as provide the broader context that Kevin outlined from our panel members. Um, this is just an overview of the, the presentation that we're going to do today. We're going to start talking about immediate workforce needs, and I will talk about the university perspective there. Joanna Richard will talk, give us a statewide perspective. Then we're going to stop and have some conversation. I'll provide a stop and have some conversations about questions you might have, as well as a policy issue we would like to share with you and get your feedback on. Kim Kinchy will then talk about economic development and the workforce, which kind of straddles both meeting immediate needs and thinking about the future development of the state. Then we'll stop and have more conversation. And finally, um, Carl will talk about the future development and we'll pose a few more questions at the end. So we're hoping <coughs> I'll, I'll try to manage the conversation so we have time for a lengthy discussion at the end, so uh, I apologize in advance. I have to cut you off when we hit the mark on time um, to move forward. We see college degrees as build the basic building blocks for a strong Wisconsin and the key to developing a prosperous future for our state. Um, research has shown that the broader access to higher education yields higher personal income, greater economic productivity, better health, health outcomes for individuals, stronger communities, and healthier democracy for our nation. And Kevin mentioned the 32,000 graduates um, in 2008. Here's some other statistics about our, our um, production of college graduates, which form the basic um, underlying building block for 
for the state. While these statistics are impressive, our growth agenda seeks to grow the over overall pool of college education, educated citizens even further, reaching into underserved populations, improving retention and graduate, graduation rates for the students as, who come to our campuses. And most, and ultimately, we believe, contributing to reaching President Obama's goal of more than 51% of the adult population with post-secondary education by the year 2020. Baccalaureate degree for the 21st century is, is similar to those that many of us um, achieved in the last century, um, but there are some important components that make it different moving forward. And the American Association of Colleges and Universities, our partners in the LEAP agenda, have surveyed business leaders and employers from around the country regarding what they're looking for in new employees. And this is what they said they needed. They found that college students need to be educated broadly <coughs> with a focus on learning outcomes that lead to successful lives and livelihoods. And if these look familiar to you, they should because they're very closely allied with the UW system shared learning outcomes, which you know we developed um, these shared learning goals for the UW system last year, outlining the competencies that every UW graduate will develop as part of their college education. The research is clear that broad preparation arms students with the adaptability that they will need to succeed in the average of 10 different jobs they hold over their work lives. So now um, to give us some statewide perspective on what these issues look like, I'd like to introduce Deputy Secretary Joanna Richard from the Department of Workforce Development. Twenty-four years ago, I used to give a monthly speech before the Board of Regents, and Judith, I think, was the only person that's probably still here from those days, but I was President of the United Council back then, and before we had a student in the Board of Regents, now you have two, um, in fact, we passed it during my term, um, I used to give a monthly speech, and uh, Dr. Lawton, who was the uh, President of the Board of Regents, was the most gracious and understanding person I've ever met, and uh, so learned a lot. So. You have big shoes to fill, uh, President Pruitt. <laughs> I also am appreciative to be here. I am a big fan of the UW system, uh, both financially and uh, practically. I'm a proud student of the U University of Wisconsin Oshkosh and uh, very much support the leadership we have with Chancellor Wells. Um, my husband is an adjunct professor at UW-Madison in the School of Library Science. My oldest son, our oldest son, is a student in accounting at UW-Milwaukee, and our youngest son is about to start at UW-Stevens Point in environmental studies. So we are we're very much a family of the UW system. The uh, topic I wanted to bring up today, just a little overview, is to give you an economic snap, uh, economic, economic update, and then go on to the workforce challenges, and there are many. Um, our projected workforce needs from our Office of Economic Advisors and our um, Labor Market Information section. A little bit about Governor Doyle's workforce agenda, which I think is very much in tune with, uh, our, our piece of it is very much in tune with the growth agenda for the UW system. A bit about the opportunities and the assistance that we're getting from President Obama and through the American uh, Recovery and Reinvestment Act, and then the role, some suggested roles for the UW system as we uh, go forward. And I'll quickly go through some of these because you, you'll see that some of this is in your packet, so you'll see the charts and have time to study them later. Um, but I can't emphasize enough, and I think uh, President Pruitt mentioned this, that it is a very challenging time in our uh, national economy. And this recession is affecting all states. Um, it's impacting unemployment, employment, and many dislocations. Our focus on workforce development and much of what Vice President Martin mentioned is education and training are key to moving forward. And now is the time when we have extended unemployment benefits to really put people back into training opportunities to reskill and upskill um, the uh, skills that they currently have so that we can have them be a better participant in the economy. We also are looking for new partnerships um, with industries and education and government 
so that we can best need, meet the needs of the industries we currently have and then grow them, and then also anticipate the needs of the emerging uh, industries. This is a little sobering news, especially when you uh, are the department that gives out unemployment checks every week. Um, the national economy and the unemployment rate um, last month, or the last month that we reported on, May of 2009, the unemployment rate for the nation was 9.1. That's up from 5.2 in May of last year. Our state unemployment rate is 8.7. That's more than double that it was last year. And just to give you a little perspective, we are currently on a weekly basis giving out $40 million in UI benefits every week. That's a staggering number, and that's just the amount that the Wisconsin benefits are covering. The, the uh, National um, Federal Department of Labor has extended that for 59, uh, 59 weeks above our 26 weeks, or 53 weeks above our 26 weeks. So we now have extended benefits up to 79 weeks. So the $40 million only accounts for the 26 weeks the state pays for. The rest are all paid by the federal government. So you can see that the volume of people having that safety, only having that safety net is very staggering. It's about 200,000 to 250,000 claimants every week. Another sobering uh, statistic here is our plant closing and mass layoffs. As the department that collects that information, as industries ha are required to report to us, you can see in 2007 that we had a little under 7,500 um, workers that were affected by mass layoffs. In 2008, that rose to 17,000. Already this year, we're up to 12,000, anticipating that we'll have about 25,000 mass layoffs and plant, uh, are affected by plant close -off closings. Uh, those are sobering statistics for us. Um, and it's also um, talent that we're hoping that we can capture and then re um, redeploy into new industries. Just a little bit about the challenges we face and um, as the Board of Regents, often you'll talk about college entrance. Um, what we um, look at is the folks that might not even have the ability to enter either a tech college or a UW <laughs> campus and how we go about that has been very, very challenging. In the past years, we've had shrinking federal resources, changing demographics, whether that means um, certain, certain labor shortages in some fields, but the skills mismatch in many others, profound technical, technological changes. Um, many of what Vice President Martin talked about is that you're having different skill sets that are needed in this economy. Limited student, parent, and school knowledge about the labor force, something that we're trying to address with both the both DPI, the UW system, and the tech college system to get better career information to students at a very young age so that we can prepare them, especially in, um, in engineering, math, and science, and the technologies. Poverty um, has continued to be our greatest challenges, and it will continue to be if we don't address the economic benefits. They go hand in hand. And ironically, we have skilled uh, worker shortages in many areas of our state, and we can't fast enough get those folks into the system. The increased worker productivity is also important, and I'll go to the next slide because you'll see a little bit about that. Um, the first yellow slide or line that you see indicates our Wisconsin population. Now that continues to grow, which is a good thing, but it also indicates that the baby boom generation um, is impacting the amount of workforce, which is the second line you see. So as our population is increasing, our workforce is actually um, being stagnant, if not decreasing slightly. That's a major challenge for us because it means that we have less people doing the jobs we need them to do, and that means they need, need to be more product, or productive. And with productivity, you need increased skills and technology. The next slide is a little bit um, hard to read, I understand on the slide, but it, it does address <coughs> what Vice President Martin talked about is that you have new skills that are needed by our workforce. As you get from what you need is more analytic and more interactive skills and less manual and routine, routine skills. So if you just think about the old assembly factories and you know manually doing things one thing at a time and it's very routine and very not a lot of skill um, needed, 
That is not the skills that we see even in our most um, advanced manufacturing plants, which um, also is the challenge for productivity. Now this is the slide that I think is the most sobering for our department and something I think that is a concern for the whole state. This is the Wisconsin workforce. And these are what we consider the workforce age 26 and over. This is a slide that the UW um, Center on Wisconsin Strategies developed for us. And it shows 5% of the, the workforce are high school dropouts. 35% have only a high school education. That's the 40% that we really need to focus in on because they likely have no skills or little skill and they need upgraded skills. And in order to move them kind of into the better circles, having more opportunity, we have a lot that we have to do with this population. Uh, many of them lack basic computer knowledge, um, so it's very hard for them to transition into the new economy. And um, many of them, even though they might have a high school um, degree, lack uh, the knowledge of moving forward in an education setting. They might have gotten their high school degree, but they don't necessarily want to go back to school. And school for them was not a positive experience. Um, so those are the populations we need to find another way to reach out to them and teach them in a different way. So something similar um, to what Vice President Martin also mentioned, as you go through um, the higher education, the higher education you get, the higher salary you get. And as you can see in Wisconsin, we do quite well on the national average for uh, producing higher wages as you get higher degrees. Um, but it's the high school, lack of high school or high school level that really is not producing families that even can, um, can function or have a family supporting wage. So here are going to be some slides that I'll go through. Um, what I want to emphasize here is that the gray shade is those degrees or those uh, occupations requiring a higher education degree. Um, and you'll, I'll go through these rather quickly, but you can study them later. But they will be focusing on most openings, fastest growing jobs, and the most new jobs. So it's really replacement jobs, most openings, and then the new jobs that are being produced. And you'll see that there are some great opportunities um, for the UW campuses and for, I think, the workforce if we can produce more of these occupations, um, we just even to um, meet the needs of this workforce. So I'll just go through this very quickly, but these are the most openings. Registered nurses, of course, um, jump to the top. The fastest growing, you have data analysts, computer software engineers, physician assist assistants, a lot in the healthcare and technology fields. Nurses, again, is on this um, slide. Here is just giving you a perspective of the the um, common overlaps of fastest growing and most openings. And you, again, you'll see that nurses is on both lists. Teachers, engineers, accountants, and auditors are on the most openings. The fastest growing, of course, is the computer software engineers, financial um, advisors, and mental health counselors. Again, here's another overlap slide. If you just look at the fastest growing and most new jobs, nurses, again, is in that sweet spot, as is computer software engineers. And uh, uh, teachers and accountants are um, professions that will have the most new jobs. Now this is comparing the other two, most openings and most new jobs. Again, you'll see nurses is right in the middle, computer software engineer, teachers and auditors. Now here's the slide that really um, speaks to kind of some of our workforce needs and nurses is on every single list and it becomes a real focus. Not only do we need new ones, replacement, but we also know that they're the fastest growing. I'm just going to, uh, many of you know uh, Governor Doyle's Grow Wisconsin agenda. Investing in people is the piece that we really focus in on. Um, qualified workers for quali quality jobs, addressing the skill shortages, raising wages, because raising wages means more to our economy and better for families, and deploying uh, training funds strategically. And you'll see some of those strategies that we've developed to do that. Um, we have a very innovative partnership with the Tech College System and the Joyce Foundation has been very helpful in helping us um, fund this and um, allowing us to lead on it. But we have a million dollar grant and we just got funded for another year with another half a million dollars um, to look at taking adult basic education and linking it with skill development 
so that as, as adults who don't have high school degrees or, don't, or lack some of the, the basic education needs can get some skill development paired with their adult basic education and then be able to feel better about going forward with higher degrees. And whether that's at the tech college or even lifelong learning, that's very necessary. And, and what we found is that if you just had adult basic education and they got their ABE or they got their DED, they don't come back for higher education. That's, they stop there and it's a, it's a terminal degree. We want to continue to, to um, move them forward on this path and uh, the Joyce Foundation has been very helpful in helping us do that. We call those programs bridge programs. They're bridging skills and adult basic education. This is one of my favorite slides um, and this is one that we've developed um, with the help of cows and others but it shows kind of the trajectory of where we want the workforce to go and this may look like low wages but this is actually where much of our population is the 40% that I mentioned, the 700,000 adults who lack, um, that are, lack a good, uh, good wages, this is kind of where their path can lead. And this is where we've really been concentrating on how to move them up this economic ladder. And as you can see on the bottom, the higher your salary goes, these are the type of institutions that can help you get there and the type of uh, career paths you might be able to do. Now if I did a similar line, but did it the opposite way, you would see a line going down the up, or if you start with where the UW arrow is and went up, you would see the actual um, draw on Wisconsin resources, whether that's Badger Care or W-2 or the Earned Income Tax Credit, you're seeing that government resources actually are supporting very much the low wages. And as, you, as families get higher wages, you actually have less government support if you can get more families, higher wages, you actually free up resources for other innovative things like economic development and like UW system. So this is something that I think we can all um, have a shared vision and a shared strategy to move forward. We very much appreciate um, the work that, that the, um, our state sector strategy um, has developed. Kim is part of that team. DPI is part of that team. The tech colleges are part of that team. Um, and then we have some industry leaders as well. And what we're looking at is um, moving forward with sector initiatives. So looking at the very um, bread and butter industries that help Wisconsin and that are very key to Wisconsin's economy and making sure that we're meeting their needs and whether that's training or whether that's education, meeting their needs and then advancing that region by region. Um, so the governor has put in $3 million to advance training for those sectors, whether it's healthcare, advanced manufacturing, biotechnology, uh, biofuels, we've been funding those type of initiatives. Um, along with that, we've been funding opportunity grants. Now opportunity grants is really kind of this gap that's produced. If you don't, if you're a, if you're a low income adult and you're working, you really don't have the resources to go back to school, whether it's night school or any other type of educational opportunity, because you're not qualified for financial aid. You have to be a half-time student to get financial aid. And opportunity grants help assist those individuals that might want to take one course at a time, can afford to take one course at a time, and then we're going to help them do that. Um, so we're very excited about opportunity grants. We think it's actually a way to jumpstart some skill development and the governor has um, made that a top priority. Now we're using our federal resources to do this, um, but we're hoping that once we get through kind of this economic downturn, that we'll have more resources to put through that. Uh, Skills Jumpstart is something that we've been working in one of our bridge programs, kind of uh, as a result of our work with the Joyce Foundation. Emerging, emerging Industry Skills Partnerships, this is um, something we've been funding for the last two years. Um, we've been focusing on biotechnology, biofuels, advanced manufacturing. Um, similar to the emerging industries we know need assistance, especially in training if they have workforce needs, and we've been funding that. Um, you know, manufacturing continues to be one of our top producers of jobs, and we want to make sure that they advance their skills, and we've been supportive of something that the National um, Association of Manufacturers has um, developed called Manufacturing Skills Standards, and we've been funding that throughout the state for workers that want to get skill development while they're still on the job, 
but they also then end up helping that manufacturer. And then we're doing some skill assessment, and we're actually doing this with federal dollars as well. It's something that ACT has developed called the Work Keys. It's kind of the skill assessment and certification, and um, we're doing that right now with our reemployment services for our UI claimants. A little bit more about our sector strategies. This is the collaboration between government, industry, labor, and education. Um, this, these are the sector groups that are being uh, developed throughout the, the state. New North is probably the best example of this, and Chancellor Wells and others from that area of the state um, have probably talked about their great work and bringing together all these sources and then looking at the industry needs that they have, whether it's in advanced manufacturing or healthcare, and now with the wind and energy um, that they've been producing. Some of our key partners for that, um, as you can see, it's pretty extensive for the education. Um, we've also had many of business and industry leaders, um, and we're very grateful that Tim Sullivan, who is the president of Busiris um, in Milwaukee, has been leading that effort for us in the Council on Workforce Investment. Um, what we're hoping to do with this is really develop new ways and new career paths for low-income workers so they can get onto a lifelong learning um, a trajectory and we're forming these regional partnerships we're identifying the training needs and then skilling up um, in those needs um, by working with the tech colleges or other training institutions to produce those type of training opportunities and we're hoping that as we launch them along their way that those um, connections continue whether it's from the tech college to the UW system that they continue along the way and there's always opportunity um, for a worker that wants to advance their skills Just a little bit more about our sector uh, strategies. Um, the $3 million grants, so far we've um, invested in healthcare and life sciences, information technology, renewable energy, next generation agriculture, which is actually a very exciting, and I know that you've talked about that as part of your growth agenda, advanced manufacturing and building and construction. Um, ironically, right now, building and construction, we have a lot of workers on what we would say on the bench. Um, they're very skilled. Um, they're very talented, they have um, apprenticeship background, so they're you know, very skilled professionals, but they're on the bench because we don't have enough jobs to fill. And so we're hoping with the recovery that we can get them off the bench and start additional apprenticeship opportunities um, because we know that our projections will indicate that we need more skilled trades and that will grow. Um, one of the efforts that Secretary Gassman has uh, dedicated a, a much of her time to throughout um, her career at DWD is on the Select Committee on Healthcare Workforce Development. Healthcare um, continues, as we mentioned, with the nurses uh, being a very um, high demand, most job openings, kind of that sweet um, job growth area. Um, this group has been very active in looking at how we can advance the training opportunities, filling the pipeline for the works or the jobs we know need to be filled. And we have been very, very appreciative of the work um, and the collaboration from many of our partners at the UW system and at the Technical College. And I just listed a few of our partners here and the members that were from the UW system or campuses. Some of the recommendations that they've made include recruitment and retention issues, um, apprenticeship career path that you'll hear more about as we um, move forward. We're actually one of the Department of Labor grants that we're requesting from the Recovery Act is to de more fully develop this apprenticeship career pathway for long-term um, healthcare workers. The education capacity in clinical sites continues to be a very challenging um, problem for us, for the state. Um, we're not getting enough clinical sites, so you can't get enough um, skilled nurses into those into the programs to get the experience that they need to get their degree. Um, so that continues to be a um, problem, um, but we're looking at strategies to do that. And then we also, um, there have been partners that have gotten grants um, in order to advance that strategy. And then uh, most importantly, the Wisconsin Healthcare Workforce Data Collaborative, um, headed up by Tim Size, has been very, very focused on how can we best survey the nurses and the healthcare professionals 
on how long they're going to be in the workforce so that we know exactly when we're going to need to fill those slots, whether it's replacement or new. Because what's happening a lot in the nursing industry is they'll get their degree, but they're not necessarily continue on nursing. Um, and we need to get more nurses into our hospitals and clinics and home settings. Um, and that data is going to be very important because it will help our training institutions, whether it's tech college or UW's uh, campuses and other healthcare um, education facilities to really know exactly how many slots and how many opportunities or classes they need to um, develop in order to meet those needs so that they're immediate and long term. The Medical College of Wisconsin did um, grant this group and it's a collaboration with, um, with many of the partners on the healthcare workforce committee um, additional assistance and $300,000 grant. So we're hoping that a lot of that work, um, that data collection can be done. And in addition to that, um, Senator Robson put in the latest budget um, a increase in the nurses licensing fee and that fee will then go to data collection and nursing development. Uh, so we're very um, excited about that opportunity and think that we can get some good information for the university campuses that need that. A little bit about our American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. $7.6 billion is coming to Wisconsin. I can't believe every time I say billion, it's an amazing amount of, of resources coming to our state. Um, it was projected by the Office of Management and Budget that that would create or save 70,000 jobs in Wisconsin. Um, much of the work that we are doing, putting people to work, rebuilding Wisconsin and getting our economy moving are funded through those initiatives. Just to give you a little idea of what resources we have in our department for kind of the lowest skilled and the uh, lowest income individuals, the dislocated worker and adult services, $16 million the dollars went out to the Workforce Development Boards, $5 million in adult services, in youth, uh, $13.8 million. Now this is above and beyond their normal formula dollars. And much of that you're already hearing about for the summer youth programs. They've already been launched um, very successfully in many areas of the state. Um, they're giving opportunities to young individuals um, to get work experience and then launch kind of their work experience to launch them into a new job. Um, we're expecting that about 4,000 summer youth will be served by that program this summer. Reemployment services, this is um, it's kind of going back to the future for most of the Department of Labor programs. It used to be that you, when you walked into the UI office, you would go in for your UI check and you'd fill out a form and then they'd give you a card and you'd go over to job service and they'd help you look for a job. Well, with the, the invention of call centers, you don't have that interaction anymore. Uh, so we've developed a program kind of back to the future where we're going to be working with UI claimants, helping them look at their skills, what are transferable skills into the labor market, and then helping them find the resources they need, whether that's continuing education, whether that's um, short-term training, whether it's on-the-job training that we can partner with an industry on. We're looking for those opportunities and we have $7 million from the Recovery Act to do that. Um, but we've also invested some of our UI dollars, some of our administrative dollars, 3.8 of that to augment that. So it's about a $12 million program and that will be conducted over the next two years. We've already launched our first uh, cohort um, these last two weeks. Oh, I should go back. Maybe I can't. Um, I wanted to mention the vocational rehab. We have a $10 million in additional resources for that. Much of that is spent at the UW campuses or at the tech colleges. For people with disabilities, if they want an employment plan, and this is probably one of the best programs, um, I think it's a great federal and state partnership. If the, the plan that we develop is to make sure that you have your highest, your highest opportunity met. So if you want to be a lawyer, we'll develop a plan and we'll help you fund it if, you have, uh, if you're qualified for that program. If you want to be a nurse, we'll help you reach your goal to be there. Um, and that program has been very successful and has launched many, many people with disabilities to be a, a participating member of the labor force. And we're very happy that we got $10 million in addition for that program. And then unemployment services, I mentioned a little bit about the extra 
53 weeks of unemployment benefits that we're able to um, extend. The Recovery Act also um, has some great opportunities for grant opportunities in various sectors, and there will be energy, um, $500 million from the Department of Labor. Actually, I should go to the next slide. $500 million from the Department of Labor for energy efficiency and energy um, grant training opportunities. There are five levels of how you apply for those funds, but we're already, re already reaching out to our partners in the UW system and the tech colleges and in industry um, to launch some of those innovative programs. And then we also, um, they haven't reached or um, deployed these yet, but $250 million in healthcare grants that are likely to come within the next couple weeks. So a little bit about the role of the UW system and um, quickly just some collaborative um, efforts that we might be able to look forward to. Addressing the workforce development data, that's very important. Our labor statistics unit can be very helpful to that. I think there's a lot of data that we all collect that if we collaborate on, we could get a better picture of where our economy is going, what our needs are, and where we can best um, deploy our resources. Addressing workforce development capacity needs, identifying that and identifying it well is very necessary. Aligning the education and regional workforce and economic development needs. This is part of our regional economic development efforts and it's very important that we look at our partners wherever they are and meet the needs of the industries within those regions because as you know, if we can grow our regions economically, that that's a healthier way to approach economic development. I think we all agree that providing well-educated workforce for tomorrow is key and um, making sure that we don't forget that we have the 700,000 workers out there that don't have an opportunity right now to get into any of our higher education um, institutions and that we need to do more to assist them to move forward or they will continue to be um, a, a situation where our economic development is impacted. Providing opportunities for research, spin-offs, and new careers. I can't tell you how important it is for all of our campuses and the work that you do to develop um, new resources, new technologies, because that helps our industries um, to grow. I was just at a meeting with the Midwest Governors Association talking about energy, and um, Wisconsin's well poised in both biofuels, geothermal, energy efficiency, um, and we are moving forward really in a, in a very strategic manner, and we're working with the Midwest governors to do that because the Midwest region has some very incredible assets. And as we build those assets, um, I think that uh, we will do well. But the universities are really the key to that because they're the ones that launch the new develop, where they launch the new technologies that help us um, make those real and commercialize them. And then, as Mary Keene mentioned, I can't emphasize enough either the seamless system of lifelong learning, having those opportunities, filling in the gaps, not having barriers put in front of uh, individuals that want to move forward with their academic or their educational needs, that um, we make it very efficient, make it very clear, and make it very seamless. Um, and I hope that um, as we move forward, that's uh, something that we can work together on. Thank you. We're going to stop for questions in just a minute, but first I wanted to share with you um, some of the ways in which our campuses are actively involved in realigning their programs arrays to meet regional and state needs. And um, those of you that are on the Education Committee know that we utilize workforce development data in the review process for all of our new academic programs, and indeed though these data are very important as individual campuses identify potential areas for program development in moving forward. So I'm going to share with you details in a few key areas in the next several slides. Um, healthcare is clearly a growing field on, as a discipline of study on almost all of our campuses. And nursing is a key concern in that review, in that study. Um, we last year had a nursing education task force that looked at aligning the, the programming that we have in nursing with needs across the state and we've been working in a number of areas since that time to meet those needs. We have nine new programs approved in the healthcare arena in the last year, 
three years, including the Doctor of Nursing Practice, which will specifically address the need for nursing faculty and clinical placement faculty to support the pipeline in nursing. We have our nursing programs are available at three extended sites beyond the campuses. Um, the Milwaukee program is offered in Kenosha. The Osh Eau Claire program is offered in Marshfield. The Oshkosh program is offered in Wausau and soon will also be in Rock County. And so I think that, that and, and we have an online degree completion program for RNs across the state to move their RN into a BSN. So we're, we are doing a lot within the limited resources that we have to, to meet those needs. Not to say we can't do more and we continue to look for new opportunities for moving those, those opportunities further out into the state. The articulation agreements with the Wisconsin Technical College are a very important part of this picture and we have 16 of those that are available on multiple campuses around the state. Um, I also wanted to give you an example of, of, of an area in the healthcare field where we are working to meet, to address the workforce capacity issues in the context of the, the challenges that we are facing with the system. You'll know from our research, recent meetings that we have been looking at the academic program array across the system working with the individual campuses to focus their, their academic program resources in the areas where they can make the biggest difference, where they can be distinctive. And within the context of that work, UW-Madison's College of Medicine and Public Health recently made the decision to, to, um, to cease to, to suspend admissions to their clinical laboratory sciences bachelor's degree program because it's offered elsewhere in the state. When this news got out, there was great concern in the hospital and healthcare community that Madison was closing what turns out to be a rather small program. They have 20 new students admitted every year. And I wanted you to know that they did that within the context of, in, of, a, program, of a program across the system that's growing. Over the last three years, our program has grown by more than 30% in terms of the number of graduates in clinical laboratory system, sciences across the whole system. In addition to that, UW-Milwaukee is continuing, has additional new students in the pipeline and will be adding another 40 graduates to that growing number in the next year. I've been working closely with, with all four programs that we have out, and with the College of Medicine at Madison to see if there are additional ways that we could, could continue to expand because we know from our colleagues in the field that they, there is a increasing demand in this area. Clinical sites are of course a challenge to us and one that we don't necessarily have the resources or ways to control within the University of Wisconsin system. We really need to look at our partners in the communities, the hospitals and the clinics who need to be accredited to be able to provide clinical sites for our students. But we do have our working together to, to address that capacity issue. In the area of engineering, um, We've had also had an engineering task force report where we looked at the, where, we, where was the need for additional engineering programs across the state. And what we learned from that analysis was that our engineering programs all have additional capacity. We could, we could definitely train more engineers if we could attract more students prepared coming into college prepared and interested in going into engineering. So we've been focusing a number of our efforts at trying to increase the high school preparation, particularly in the areas of mathematics, in collaboration with our colleagues across the PK-16 continuum, um, so that we will ultimately, we hope, see more students going into this challenging field. Um, despite that, we are continuing to add new programs in engineering to meet emerging needs in that area as well. <clears throat> Technology is a key area where our articulation agreements with the Wisconsin Technical College System play a very important role. Um, and let me just give you a little bit of what's behind the numbers here. There are 19 articulation agreements in this area of technology with the Wisconsin Technical College's system. So there are 19 different agreements. Most of these agreements are between one UW campus and multiple technical college campuses. So if you want to count each one of those partnerships as an articulation agreement, we'd actually have 88 across the state. 
eighty eight opportunities for students to start at a technical college in a technical field and then move in a pretty in a seamless way knowing which courses are going to transfer into one of our UW college campuses and finish with a baccalaureate <coughs> degree in technology. Most of our new program proposals in this area include collaboration with one or more technical colleges and that's one of the things that we look for in academic affairs as we are seeing program proposals coming forward in many fields, especially in technology, we look for whether or not that collaboration with the technical college is in place so that we can take advantage of that pipeline as well. Teacher education has been a long-standing priority for the UW system and I know you saw teachers come up on several of um, Deputy Secretary Richard's slides. But it's one that we need to continue to be focusing on to make sure that we are meeting the, the emerging needs for teachers across the state. And again, we've put together a statewide task force which has not yet completed its work, which is currently examining the match between our systems and the need for different kinds of teachers, both regionally and, and statewide. We had a, a DIN, a fund, special state funding in the last biennium, to address teacher education, particularly to help us develop programs and attract students that would um, provide us more teachers in high demand fields such as science, <coughs> technology, and math, and special education, and, and in addition help us recruit more teachers of color into these programs. And then finally, um, degree completion programs for adult students which Mary Keene talked about earlier are a very important component in developing Wisconsin's workforce and providing students with advanced education that they need to, to advance in their current organizations or to move into new lines of work and we have a number of examples that I know you've heard about before in this arena. And so now I know we um, would like to stop and put this question in front of you in terms of a big policy question that we've identified of, you know, in these times of budgetary constraints, we need to figure out how to balance our core academic programs with the challenges of meeting these emerging needs. And um, so I'd like to give you an opportunity to ask questions of Deputy, Deputy, Deputy Secretary, sorry. My, <laughs> my title is a mouthful too. Um, Joanna Richard or me or share your concerns or ideas with each other. So we'll probably do this for about, I'm going to cut it off after about 10 minutes so we'll be sure to have um, time for our other panelists. So, the floor is yours. Agent Davis. <laughs> this is a question for um, Deputy Secretary Richard. Um, really fascinating presentation. <clears throat> um, good balance of hope and challenge. Right. Um, I have really uh, a real short question, and a, you know what? I'm going to scrap all of that. I'm just going to go to the real big one that I really, I think it's a big one that I really am interested in, and that is how are you marketing these opportunities, um, particularly the um, 1.5 million opportunity grants, but the other ones that that are geared toward creating jobs um, at the grassroots level. When I look at Milwaukee, for example, as you know, I'm from Milwaukee, I think one of the uh, big issues that I am picking up, I listen to a certain radio station every morning as my gauge and, and you know, what's happening on the ground. And I'm, it's clear in my mind that the messages on how to access programs or get jobs is not coming through to the people who need it most. And so as I look at this um, opportunity with this opportunity grants, I'm curious as to what the strategies are that are being employed to get the message to those who really need the help in the first place. For example, are you using feet on the street people? Are you doing radio? You know, what, what, what is the plan? Thank you. Great. That's an excellent question. Um, and that's, you actually hit on one of our challenges. We work within our current system. So in Milwaukee, it's the Milwaukee Workforce Investment <coughs> Board. So our funds flow through them, and um, so the opportunity grants are flowing through them. Um, but we are reaching out to um, community groups to get the word out to individuals that then can go to the Workforce Development Board and ask for those opportunity grants. But that's not all we're doing, because that's their system. I mean, that's the system that they have to live within. We're also within our job service, and when we're dealing with UI claimants, 
And we know that if they took one course or they got this one opportunity, our job service folks will also be referring. Um, and we're going through about 10,000 UI claimants a month that we're going in and assessing their skills, putting them through this work um, certification program, helping them with career guidance, knowing what the labor market projections are, and knowing what their skills are and what their opportunities are. And so that's another way. 1.5 million is only a drop in the bucket. Um, in fact, um, the Council on Workforce Investment, who developed these, pro the, these recommendations, um, they actually recommended $20 million. But in this budget, there was no way we could get $20 million. And so we took our discretionary dollars, the governor uh, dedicated his discretionary dollars to at least launch it. And we're hoping that by launching it, we advance it. Um, so in, in this time, that was the best we could do, but it's near, not even near enough. Um, but Milwaukee continues to be a challenge, and part of it is that you do have segmented community groups that kind of a little bit knows a little bit more about what they, you know, their segment might know, and they're not all connected. And so we're hoping that with the mayor-led now Milwaukee Workforce Investment Board, that we're going to have more um, attachment to the needs of the community as opposed to having, you know, a countywide group that they had before, that it really will be focused on the city of Milwaukee. Um, and that's probably the best I can give you for now, and it is only a drop in the bucket, but we are working with community groups to get the word out, and then our job service staff are referring people as they see um, the needs um, exhibited. We should pass much. Thank you. Uh, I found the in reports both are very informative about and attempting to maybe in very indirectly address your policy question. I was um, <coughs> impressed with the number of instances that you've indicated that there's articulation between the technical college system and the UW system. Uh, and I think that is one way to try to address under budgetary constraints that uh, the systems are not necessarily duplicative or but they're, they're really complementary to each other. The, the question that, that I um, have is, uh, why do we still have this constant uh, cry that the systems are not working and that there are many bumps on the road um, when you talk about all these agreements that are there? Uh, either is it because there may be all these wonderful agreements, but they're not in the areas that students are interested in, or somehow the general populace is not aware there well, seems to be a disconnect cause, because it, at every technical college board meeting that I go to, or many of them, I should say many, uh, the question again is there's not enough articulation discussion be, uh, occurring between the UW and the, the technical college system, yet you're showing a wonderful array of, mm -hmm. of instances here. We have, um, that, that's really a good question, and it's one that we are studying at this time. Um, we are part of a <coughs> study, um, you remember the equity scorecard. Um, the Center for Urban Education at um, the University of Southern California, who is our partner in the equity scorecard project, identified the transfer pathway between two-year colleges, whether they be technical colleges or our own UW colleges, and our four-year institutions as an important issue for us if we're thinking about students of color. Um, exceeding and, and, and graduating with a four-year degree in our state. But this really applies, what we'll learn here will apply to all of our students. Um, they've identified this pipeline as one that is working better in other places than it is in Wisconsin, gotten a grant from the Ford Foundation to work with us to identify where the obstacles are along that pathway. And our colleagues at the Tech College System are part of this study with us, so we hope to lear learn more about it. I guess on the surface, of though of the issue, I would observe that I think some of the students that we hear from that are not finding their way through this process are not finding their way because they don't know what they want when they start. So they begin in a technical college program that does not have an articulation agreement. They take courses while they're trying to figure out what they want to do and they may not be courses that line up with an articulation or line up with a pathway that takes them to the baccalaureate degree. But as they're getting towards the end of completing their time, then they start thinking about, oh, well, maybe I need to, to go further. 
And at that point, trying to line things up is not as easy. So part of the issue for us, I think, is find, figuring out better ways to reach students, better ways to, to, to have people thinking about a baccalaureate degree as a possible um, goal, although they may be starting in a program where they're focused more on, on an outcome that's related to employment after a two-year degree. So some of it is that. Um, that's not all of it, so I don't, so, and we'll learn more as we move forward. And I don't know, um, we probably don't have time now, but it would be interesting in the, if we have time as we get further into this to hear from our colleagues from Tech College, if Kathy Collins here, and maybe could give us a perspective as well. But I, I hesitate to take us down that path because I'm mindful of the time. Thank you. Other questions, comments, Regent Davis? Sorry, but this no is a topic I'm very interested in. So um, let me just rattle off a few statistics and ask and, and, and urge something. Uh, one is that my understanding is that the unemployment, uh, excuse me, the poverty rate um, in Milwaukee has increased to 26%. Um, you cited a statistic of 5% dropout, high school dropout rate. For the state. For the state, but I'm relatively confident a big chunk of that is in Milwaukee. 57% uh, unemployment rate for African American males between the ages of 16 and 64. That's up from 51% last year. And I see a big collision course. And so my concern is that with the efforts to do job development and as they uh, pertain to getting more college degree holders and, uh, and all of that, that we're going to miss a huge population that is probably the most challenging. And, and I wonder what the strategies are of focusing on that kind of collision course that's going on, if you've got some. Yeah, that's exactly what the RISE, our effort with the Joyce Foundation, looks at. Because what we're seeing is that you might have uh, individuals that have a skill, whether it's <laughs> carpentry or whether it's you know, something that they feel confident in, but learning in the classroom is not the way they learned it. Mm -hmm. And so you have to really look at contextual learning along with academic learning and, and reach them in a different way. So you have to be very kind of flexible about how you deliver those services. So our bridge programming that we're developing with the tech college system and the, through the, you know, the linking the adult basic education with a skill component, which is very expensive because really you're dealing with two different systems coming together. But that really, that bridge program can be very helpful to keeping them confident that they can learn and that they have, um, you know, ability to, to move forward. And that is going to be challenging. You know, when we look at, you know, and, and I know the pipeline that the UW looks at is really kind of the graduates of the K-12 system for the most part. I know that there's adults that come back into the system. But that's your pipeline. What we're looking at is those 700,000 individuals that are already past academic, you know, they've not taken um, an academic um, choice and they're already in the workforce or they're not in the workforce, not fully participating in the workforce, that is a very staggering challenge because most of those need some type of skill upgrade and you're not going to reach them the way we, they already failed in some sense or they feel like they failed in some sense in a setting that, th that now you're asking them to go back to, and that's not going to work. So we have to find a different way to reach them. And these bridge program programs can be very helpful. You know, part of the apprenticeship program, this is one of the, the, the um, I think, attractions to Wisconsin, because we developed the apprenticeship program in Wisconsin. It's almost 100 years old. Is you can learn on the job, and then you learn it in the classroom. So the, the competency and the self-concept you get from learning it on the job and then having it applied or learning in the classroom is a very good educational technique. And you can take, you know, you can develop this career pathway. If you want to be an electrician and you start learning and you, you know, start learning on the job and getting the kind of mentoring that apprenticeship gives you, you can get your associate's degree with, you know, additional education once you get the apprenticeship. And then you can go on to a four-year degree and be an electrical engineer. That's a career path. But to start them is the hard part, is to start them on the career path. Um, and so those are the things, that I, and just in my career at DWD, I have seen much more seamlessness between the tech college and the UW, and it's been very, very rewarding to see that. And I think there is a lot more collaboration ongoing, and I think that you'll see more of that to come. Regent Fassman. You're, you're Last Regent Fassman. Thank you. I think this is the volley, isn't it? Uh, it's ping pong. Go ahead. Um, 
Looking at that pie chart on 40% workforce, I noticed you didn't say much, both of you, about that 16% some degree, some college, but no, no degree. And, and I'm curious as to why hardly anything was mentioned. And the reason I'm, I'm bringing that up is, is that, again, trying to address your question, is that an area that has a greater potential where at least some individuals, whether it be at the uh, technical college or the university setting, they've, they've had the experience, for whatever reason they've dropped out. Uh, and I'm looking at Chancellor Wilson or with in terms of the UW extension or well, uh, the, we the certainly technical college. That somehow, is that potentially a path of we certainly yes, see returning adult students as a, as, a, as a primary audience for us to be reaching as we think about increasing the level of baccalaureate degree holders in the state. And the adult student initiative at UW Extension and the colleges is one important initiative. The two, um, you know, the degree completion programs and the 15 or so, I think, flexible degree programs, that baccalaureate degree programs we have across our system. Um, for returning adult students who can put together different kinds of experiences along with coursework to leading up to a baccalaureate degree is another important avenue. It's one that we're looking at very carefully as part of the Making Opportunity Affordable um, project that we are working with the technical colleges and DPI on. So we, we do see this as an important area for us to be focusing on and and see that if we're, if we're going to hit those targets that President Obama has set for us, we're going to have to reach the adult students and get them back into college and finish. If it's okay with you now, um, we'll move on. And I'd like to introduce now Kim Kinchy, who is the director of the Division of Entrepreneurship. Vice President, Chancellor Wilson. I'm sorry. I would like to make a comment about Regent Vasquez's comments. Um, several years ago, UW Extension did conduct a survey uh, of adults in the state with some college credits, and that survey revealed uh, that about 70,000 adults uh, indicated that if indeed we made the opportunity uh, available for them to come back to the UW to get a degree, that they would seriously consider that. And so we used those results actually to undergird our adult student initiative and we have now those programs in place uh, throughout the UW where we are targeting uh, those, those adults all over the state who already have some college credits to come back into our classrooms. That's the first point. Uh, the second is that within the UW colleges, 35% uh, of the students that we served, about 13,200 students overall, uh, are returning adult students. Uh, and so we are reaching uh, returning adult students through both of the statewide institutions in the UW system, through the colleges, uh, where roughly about four or 5,000 of our 13,000 uh, plus students are returning adult students, and then through UW Extension based on the survey results that we, we achieved. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now we'll hear from Kim Kinch. This is a nice segue into uh, talking about the UW Extension, so thank you for that opportunity. Good morning. I'm very pleased to be here today to talk a little bit about uh, the activities and initiatives that are going on within the UW Extension, and in particular, the area that uh, I work with, which is the Division of Entrepreneurship and Economic Development. I thought that perhaps today it would be worthwhile to spend just a few minutes to make sure that you understand what the picture is of the overall UW Extension involvement and how it fits into the University of Wisconsin system. Some of you have seen this before. We use this slide quite a bit when we go out and talk to various uh, uh, business groups, to the legislature, to the congressional delegations, and I'm always a little bit surprised to find that they're surprised as to where the Extension fits in on this. But you'll notice on the left you have the two doctoral universities, then the 11 comprehensive universities, than the 13 freshman and sophomore colleges, and then UW Extension. So it's all part of the system, all working together and collaborating on a lot of different initiatives. The next slide will give you a little bit more of a breakdown of the divisions within Extension. You'll notice there's Cooperative Extension on the far left. 
Broadcast and media innovations, that's public radio and public television, that always seems to surprise people. I don't know where they think those are located, but uh, certainly within the extension. Continuing education, outreach, and e-learning, which uh, Chancellor Wilson just addressed in, in some of the questions that were raised. And then the Entrepreneur and Economic Development Division, which is the one that I'll spend a little bit of time on today talking about how the activities of this division directly impact workforce development throughout the state. I thought it would also be interesting for you to see the larger picture of extension and extensions work within the state. I think this really captures the tremendous amount of presence that we have statewide. If you look at this slide and down in the lower left you find the key where you can identify the UW colleges campuses, the four-year campuses, the small business development centers, statewide reach of Wisconsin Public Radio as well as Wisconsin Public Television, and then the cooperative extension. You can see that really we cover the state very, very thoroughly. And I think it's not only important to understand that, perhaps, but perhaps more importantly, we provide access to a wide variety of resources and information to everyone in the state. Every citizen has access to this. And it's a wonderful resource that we hope will continue to have people take greater and greater advantage of. Let me provide you with some specific information dealing with the uh, Division of Entrepreneurship and Economic Development, which is affectionately known by many people in the legislature as DEED. So uh, if I use that acronym, you'll know where that's come from. I think it's important to focus on two critical areas that impact workforce development, as well as economic development and entrepreneurship. One of those areas is the Small Business Development Centers. And in your packet, you have the annual report. Please take a look at that. There's a lot of data in there. I'm just going to hit a few of the more relevant ones that I think would be important for you to understand. But there's a lot of data in there. And I'd be more than happy to answer any questions on that um, as, the, uh, as the presentation goes along or at the conclusion of the presentation. But the Small Business Development Centers are a collaborative partnership with the Small Business Administration. So that means that we get involved in many federal activities and federal policies and the congressional delegates that represent the state of Wisconsin. The other critical area focusing on workforce development is the Wisconsin Entrepreneurs Network. And that's affectionately known as WEN. And that really is a collaborative relationship with the Wisconsin Department of Commerce but also crosses a lot of boundaries within state government. We work with the governor's office. We work with a number of the uh, agencies, as was reflected earlier. The sector's uh, strategies initiative is something that we're involved in. Uh, with Department of Workforce Development, looking forward into the future, we're involved in a partnership for Wisconsin's economic success, which is looking at early childhood education. Uh, we've been working with the Department of Public Instruction most recently on a project dealing with entrepreneurship included in curriculums through the K-12 arena. So again, we cross over into a lot of different areas of not only state government, of private sector, uh, as well as public policy issues. You'll notice under the services included here, these are the sorts of services provided by these two entities, business counseling, product engineering and design, feasibility, new product and invention assessments, market expansion studies, grant and loan assistance, management training, programming, and entrepreneurial training programs. Now, I think it's important to understand in the context of our subject today, which is workforce development, that these are all critical components to getting a business started, to making sure that, there, that we're providing technical assistance to make sure that business continues to be successful, and finally, assisting in the expansion or the growth of those businesses. Now, if you take that in, that con in the context of economic development and workforce development, all of these efforts, all of these efforts directly impact and influence job creation. So whether it's a startup business, the expanding business, all of these are creating jobs within the state of Wisconsin. And once again, this is a statewide effort. This is not just located in any area, which the earlier map indicated. So let's look at some specific information about each of these entities. And again, you have annual reports for not only the small business development centers in the state, but also for when. And this contains the same kind of uh, evaluation of metrics. Under the small business development centers, 
you'll notice that there is a map, which is the map on the top of the annual report, that indicates uh, where the small business development centers are located in the state. They are located uh, at uh, the four-year college campuses. It also indicates and identifies where the specialty centers are. And I would like to indicate just uh, one example of collaboration, and that's at UW Parkside, where we have the CADI Specialty Center that takes, uh, it's a tech, tech transfer process that uses uh, uh, research and development that companies don't feel is necessarily relevant to their mission. And we match that with entrepreneurs, and we work in a collaborative effort through Gateway. So many of those opportunities are taking place throughout the state. Just a few of the, the metrics here. Uh, since 2003, 1,300 entrepreneurs have participated in business planning courses. Over 500 have either started or expanded businesses within the state of Wisconsin. Eight of these centers have peer-to-peer -peer learning groups for high-growth companies in the state. Now, this is something that's very unique. Um, these are called peer-spective sessions. And what it involves is eight to ten CEOs of small businesses that get together on a regular basis that meet to talk about the problems that they're facing. They can meet quarterly, they can meet monthly, but the centers are the ones that foster that kind of discussion and they have gained tremendously in popularity and we're anticipating that there will be more of these groups as the tough economy continues to try and emerge from the recessionary uh, uh, sequences. The other one that I'd like to mention is the Wisconsin Business Answer Line. That provides free business counseling to more than 2,500 current and future business owners annually. And this is headquartered out of the Madison SBDC. Uh, their growth over the last three or four months in calls has jumped tremendously. It's a point where someone can call, someone can talk to another person on the other side of the line and get resources, get information, get some counseling. Uh, it's a very, very popular activity. In fact, Wisconsin is the only state in the nation that has that kind of a resource, hence the award that they received uh, last year. A couple other commentaries on our small business development centers that I think are relevant for our discussion today. Wisconsin ranks very, very high nationally in a comparison with what other states are offering through this program. All of our centers are nationally uh, accredited, which means, of course, there are certain standards that they're meeting on a regular basis to serve their clients. And this gets increasingly important as uh, many people are out in the marketplace offering help. An accredited program guarantees a certain level of quality that's there. But I would say in looking at the overall program for the small business development centers that the major key to the success is the strong host that we have in the state, and that's the University of Wisconsin Extension and System. We hear from states across the nation, how do you do that? How do you get that kind of cooperation? How do you get that kind of collaboration? Many states are now struggling in this recession in trying to get their small business development centers to meet the need. Um, many of the states, uh, I could use Illinois as an example, have a variety of hosts. Some are chambers of commerce, some are economic development agencies, some are colleges and universities, but there's a very little collaboration and coordination which makes them less effective. And I think we're increasingly effective, particularly in this kind of an environment. Let's look at the WEN program for just a minute. The Wisconsin Entrepreneurs Network complements and coordinates with what is going on in small business development centers around the state. It expands entrepreneurship and economic development activities by working with high impact clients, as well as with inventors and entrepreneurs that are further along in the process of either establishing a business or commercializing their particular invention. There are over 120 partners, and I would draw your attention to the uh, annual report which lists those on the inside of the back cover. Uh, there are over 120 cooperative relationships that are connected via the web that can provide resources and information to people seeking answers to tough questions in moving forward in their businesses. <coughs> there are four regions as indicated on the map. Each region has a regional director. 
those people coordinate activities within their area. Now, New North was mentioned. That's certainly one where we have a lot of activity right now. I think is an example of an employment environment with the wind energy and they're targeting on that and the technology that's going on. Uh, the director up in that area has worked very closely with New North, North and the companies to help bring that whole project throughout that, that uh, 18 county area to fruition. They also collaborate with one another throughout the state. Each of the directors has a specific expertise. And if someone in the, uh, the Madison area has a need for uh, tech transfer, they can call one of the other, other directors. And so there's a very collaborative effort. And in addition to trying to address some of the emerging problems in other areas of the state, there is also a minority business coordinator who functions in the role as a WEN director that's located in the southeastern portion of the state. But she also works throughout the state as a part of this collaborative activity. If you look at the information that's on the slide, I think this is quite impressive. If you think that WEN began in 2005, it is really accelerating in what its responsibilities are. It was created by the legislature through Act 255 to really begin to coordinate a lot of these activities that are going on, but operating in a sort of a satellite environment. And so if you look at uh, the very first uh, uh, comment here, more than $7 million for research and development was awarded to one client last year. 239 grant applications approved since 2005. A number of the clients have been, in, been finalists in the Governor's Business Plan comp Contest, and if you'll notice, in 2008 and 2009, they were the winners of that contest. Again, these are people moving companies forward, employing people, drawing people from outside of the state to work for them. And then the one that's very unique and has evolved in the last couple of years are the I&E clubs. Right now, there are 40 I&E clubs around the state. And what these organizations do, it's the coordination of WEN, usually hosted by the Small Business Development uh, Center directors in the area. But they bring people together at any stage of entrepreneurship. People that are just moving into their garage to try and create something, out of their basement to try and create something, have a product that's ready to go to market. But all these people get together and talk about the issues that they face and the challenges that they face. I was at a presentation, I did a presentation about uh, 10 days ago over in the La Crosse area. 127 INE club members were there. 127 out of that area in the state. It was absolutely amazing. And the questions that they had were fascinating. And they were setting up networks and passing cards along. Now that was one group. There are 39 others across the state. So again, this, this emerging group that's finding traction for whether it's financing, whether it's advice, whether it's counseling, whether it's education, education, they are all moving in that direction. Again, the annual report will give you more details on that kind of information. Uh, okay, oops. I'm ahead. Well, you have the, the slides uh, uh, in front of you. I'd just like to uh, give you a couple of indicators of jobs and job creation here. This is from the last impact study that was done in 2007. We're in the middle right now of our current impact study, so uh, the new data should be out within the next several months. But over 1,500 new jobs were created, that's estimated. And over 2,200 jobs were either saved or retained. That would be through counseling, that would be through education, directing people into different areas. As you could certainly assume from the uh, previous presentation, uh, demand for our services is probably at an all-time high right now. I mean, people are coming uh, in the door and having to wait in line to be served. I noticed in today's paper that the Kauffman Foundation had an article uh, released in research yesterday that indicated that of the people that are either unemployed or displaced or anticipate being unemployed, 25 to 30 percent are looking toward entrepreneurial activities. So there's an emerging group, again, that's going to be looking for our services, and we anticipate that increase. So given all the economic uncertainties that we're facing right now and dealing with, we seem to be at the right time, at the right place to provide these services. And we are certainly increasing access and building expertise to improve 
the economic well-being and quality of life for a vibrant Wisconsin. Uh, I would be happy to answer any questions, and I know the policy slide is probably up there. President Pruitt, um, we'd intended to stop at this point for some discussion. Would you like to do that, or in the interest of time, do you want to hear from Carl Gabronson and then hold the discussion period longer at the end? Can I have a sense? Uh, anybody with a pressing question now? If not, we'll move on to Carl, and then you can we can review both these sets of questions. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Now I'd like to introduce Carl Gabronson from the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation to talk about the future. Well, President Riley and President Pruitt uh, and members of the Board of Regents, I want to thank you for inviting me to visit with you. I'm going to talk a little bit about the past as well as the future. Uh, and um, what do I do here? <laughs> That's the future. <laughs> That's the future. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I want to reinforce what uh, President Riley said uh, earlier about the fact that we are in the knowledge economy and that uh, the academic research enterprise in the state uh, does create jobs. Um, the study that uh, the um, Wisconsin Technology Council put out, which I do recommend to everybody, uh, as President Riley indicated, um, states that uh, the research enterprise uh, in our UW system here in Wisconsin has um, created directly and indirectly uh, almost 40,000 jobs, and that will continue to be the case. Um, and really the universities are right now in the sweet spot of this very tough uh, economy with uh, the uh, uh, resources that the Obama administration is bringing uh, to bear, an increase in research funding, uh, we hope that we're going to increase it a lot. But this chart shows the other positive impacts that research brings, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. Um, it is jobs. It's jobs both within the university and within companies, but it's also uh, enlightening our students, giving them a better education, and allowing them to uh, stay in Wisconsin and hopefully become employed. And then also improving the lives for all of us. Um, University technology transfer is, I think, critical uh, to Wisconsin. It's been critical at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. It's uh, uh, critical at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Uh, and uh, we know that it's uh, going to be more and more important uh, for the other campuses in the UW system. Warp, WISIS, and UW-Milwaukee uh, Research Foundation together manage the intellectual property of 6,500 faculty and 170,000 students. And, you know, John uh, Wiley, the past uh, chancellor of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, used to say, at Madison we have 2,500 faculty, but we've got 40,000 students with good ideas. And we need to energize these students uh, to create jobs and create companies uh, to employ uh, our graduates. Um, today, WARF processes between three and 400 invention disclosures a year. Um, and that's the main driver uh, right now in Madison of uh, our high-tech economy. And WISIS uh, was founded in 2000. Uh, I have Maliakal John here someplace. There's Maliakal. Maliakal is the executive director of WISIS. I think many of you have met him. I call Maliakal my magician. He's got a hard job to do, and he's doing a great job with it. Um, but there are plenty of challenges, and there are uh, great opportunities. So I've been asked to talk a little bit about WARF. I think many of you know about WARF, and some of you don't. Uh, but WARF's been involved in the knowledge economy for 84 years. Uh, we were started back in 1925 by our founder, uh, Harry Steenbach, who happened to be in the Department of Agricultural Biochemistry. Um, it's interesting that the problems that Harry worked on were the problems of the state farmers. And unfortunately, I think many of the scientists at the university have gotten away from working on the problems of our state. And it's been, it's been um, encouraging and uh, exciting to me to see that in the reaccreditation process for Madison, uh, the uh, faculty and students that uh, uh, took a look at our strategic plan at Madison have started to reframe uh, the mission of the University of Wisconsin-Madison to focus back at the problems of the state. 
and then out globally. Um, but I hope that they continue with that, and I think that we've got plenty of problems in Wisconsin to work on, so hopefully we can help solve some of them. Wisconsin, uh, Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, uh, otherwise known as WARF, was uh, one of the first organizations of its kind, kind in the United States. Uh, we are tax exempt, uh, and we're managed by an independent board. We do have the chancellor of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, Biddy Martin, on our board. Uh, but the board members are all UW alums. That's a requirement in our bylaws, and they're all very successful. Um, we are the exclusive patent licensing organization for the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and our job is to try and uh, maximize uh, what the taxpayers spend on grants uh, to transfer that technology for the public benefit. And in some cases, we hopefully will bring more grant money back to the university also. Um, to date, we've contributed just under a billion dollars. This year, we'll pass over a billion dollars. Um, and it's interesting to note that uh, over a third of that is from one technology and one inventor, Hector de Boer. And Hector is still coming in every Tuesday with new inventions. Uh, he's in his uh, mid to late 70s right now. Got two kids under 10, so he's got to continue to work. Uh, he's got a new company, Deltanoid, and he's got great ideas and great comments. So WARF's mission is to uh, support uh, research at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, the two principal ways we do this is through the transfer of technology for the public benefit, and hopefully when we do that, we will bring some resources back to the university to fund for the research. And then uh, investing uh, carefully, although we've got walloped like everybody else did this past October, and we're uh, working with that struggle. But nonetheless, uh, we have been able to give to the University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, this past uh, fiscal year about $63 million. It'll be close to $60 million this year. Uh, and our projections are that we're going to continue this trend and hopefully grow that as time goes on. Um, <clears throat> a few years ago, WARF was given the National Medal of Technology. This is the highest honor that uh, the President of the United States can give any organization or individual uh, for progress in technology. And WARF freely really received it for its legacy um, and for the fact that uh, we have strong partnerships with industry. We were instrumental in helping uh, create the federal law that allows universities to take title to the research that's done uh, with federal monies. Um, and the fact that uh, we've really had a great partnership with the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, our business is a home run business. As I said, more than a third of what we've turned back to the university has come from one technology and one inventor. Um, the thing that's different about WARF and the reason why we've been able to return uh, what we have been able to return is that we've had one home run technology after another. And of course, we couldn't do that unless we were associated with a world-class major research university like the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So people come to WARF and they say, geez, how can we start a WARF? I say, you've got to start 84 years ago. Uh, <laughs> you've got to have a home run technology out of the box, invest that after the Depression, and be connected with a world-class <laughs> university. <laughs> and you can have a WARF. Right. Uh, one of the uh, more recent things that WARF has been involved in, and clearly, in our view, one of the most important things that uh, we are going to have to be involved in going forward are faculty startup companies. The first faculty startup was 13 years ago with third wave technology. And it's always nice to start with a win. Third wave was recently purchased by Hologic at uh, something like $260 million. Um, but it was a return on our investment for us. Uh, and since that time, uh, we've continued to invest and take equity in faculty startup companies. Today we have uh, equity in uh, more than 40 faculty startups. Um, and you can see uh, this chart here shows that we've been averaging about um, seven a year. The maximum used to be at Wharf that zero was too few and seven was too many. It's frankly a lot of work to get these things going. And it should be noted that uh, the companies that are spun out of the university don't all go through war. I mean, the most uh, successful startup company out of Madison, Wisconsin is Epic Technologies, which has, uh, what, 300 acres uh, south of Madison in Verona, uh, and is one of the world leaders in uh, medical, uh, digital medical technology. 
Uh, that never went through Wharf. It's got 3,000 employees, and it's a, a great spinoff from the university. Uh, and there are a number of those going on. We've got uh, great examples throughout that uh, where people just left the university with their uh, with their the gifts that the university gave them, uh, and started great uh, technologies, great companies here locally. But it is an important thing for us to do. Um, and uh, this chart just kind of shows that the startups that we have are really uh, dispersed along the technology uh, areas. Uh, just like uh, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, it's very broad and deep in the technologies that we have. Then we've got YCell. In 2000, uh, uh, Catherine Lyle came and asked if WARF uh, could uh, do the technology transfer for the other campuses in the university system. Um, and in a true public partner, uh, public-private uh, partnership, uh, we set up uh, YCIS Technology Foundation uh, and uh, hired Maliaco, which was the greatest stroke of genius I've ever had. Uh, and he's charged ahead with it. It's growing, but it's got some great successes, and we hope down the road it will have many more successes. Uh, it's right now working with uh, 11 of our uh, UW campuses, uh, and we hope that in September we'll talk more to you about some of the ideas that Maliaco's got. We have some startups coming out of them, uh, and uh, we have emerging technology centers, which we want to talk to you more about in September. But we do think that this is one of the answers that we might do, might, might use to get our technology to help create uh, more jobs uh, and help educate more students uh, for our state. The uh, one other thing I want to talk to you about uh, is the Wisconsin Institutes for Discovery. And I, I want to start out by first thanking the Board of Regents for allowing WARF to be involved in this and doing this, because this, again, is a public-private partnership. And it was your permission that allowed WARF to be the developer of this. Uh, I never thought I would be involved in a project like this. It really is the most exciting project for the WARF Board of Trustees and for WARF to be involved in. Uh, it is clearly the most collaborative project that's ever been done on the University of Wisconsin-Madison campus. We've involved uh, over 200 faculty members in the planning of this thing. Um, and when it gets uh, built, uh, it will be bigger than the facility. Uh, the goal of the donors for the Wisconsin Institutes of Discovery uh, was that uh, this would just be the hub of uh, technology partnerships that reach out uh, beyond uh, the, the facility itself throughout the campus and throughout the state and globally. Uh, it, is, of course, is a three-way partnership with WARF, uh, the Mortgage family, uh, John and Tasha Mortgage and their kids, uh, and the state of Wisconsin. Um, and it's going up in the center of campus. We are the reason that most people can't get to work on time in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully that will get cleared up. Uh, by the uh, end of this year, uh, it will be enclosed and they'll be working on the inside in just a little over a year. We hope to have a grand opening for this thing. Uh, but clearly, uh, it's... Um, one of the most interdisciplinary facilities uh, that is on this campus uh, and probably one of the most unique facilities that you'll find uh, in the country. And one of the unique aspects of this facility uh, is that uh, the main floor, which is called the town center, is being created to be uh, both a uh, university community meeting area but also a town and regional meeting area. There's going to be great symposia space, uh, great uh, dining facilities, but also great uh, telecommunication facilities so that we can communicate with people all over the state and all over the world. And then we intend to have that throughout the building. Uh, the goal here is to be able to involve researchers not just at Madison, but at other campuses in the system. Uh, we are committed to having space available in the Mortgage Institute uh, where, where researchers can come uh, both from other campuses in the system uh, and from industry and from other regions of the globe to work shoulder to shoulder with researchers at Madison. Uh, it's an experiment that is being tried elsewhere. And we think it's an experiment that will work uh, and we think it will help get the Wisconsin idea out the way we should. Uh, we also, uh, since one of the donors, Tasha Mortgage, is uh, an educator, uh, the goal is to help uh, stimulate innovative education. We've been working with 
uh, Julia and the School of Education, and we hope that we're going to have great programs that occur in there for K-12 kids to come in and learn all the exciting things that are going on in science. Um, so, the last topic I want to touch on is something that we hope to visit with you more in September, uh, and that's the Research to Jobs Task Force, which uh, uh, President Riley was um, nice enough to invite me to chair. I've been working with a committee of about uh, 21 people uh, from uh, cross disciplines, uh, both industry and within the university, uh, throughout the state. Uh, we've uh, this committee has been one of the most fabulous committees I've ever worked with. It's the first committee I've ever been a part of where they get things done on time <laughs> and get it delivered to me when I ask it to, to, to get there. Um, but um, we hope to talk to you more about it in September. Um, we have uh, a few uh, directives that the President has given us. Uh, we're looking at job creation through startups and, and uh, mature businesses. Uh, job creation through increasing research at the university, through sponsored research and increased government uh, research funding. Um, we uh, want to look at more effective ways of communicating what's uh, available from the university to industry, but we also want to look at the communication from industry back to uh, the university. And then he gave me the enviable task of making sure that these are practical and implementable in the near future, <laughs> applicable to all UW institutions, quantifiable with benchmarks, roles of UW industry, government, uh, and government to be defined. I just hope my trustees don't see this list. <laughs> Somebody expecting me to do that for work, too. Um, but <laughs> at any rate, uh, some of the salient points uh, of the task force work uh, you can uh, look at. It's been a fun task force. I think we've got some uh, great suggestions, and I do think that we'll follow the guidelines that uh, uh, President Riley gave to us, and we hope to give you a full report of that in September. Uh, and with that, uh, you can read the conclusions. I don't have to tell you if you've got any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thanks. Thank you. Well, we've got some big policy issues up here for you to consider, but um, maybe we'll start with questions from our for our last two panelists and see where you want to take the conversation from here. Questions? Please your office. Uh, Carl, uh, maybe you could give us the benefit of your personal experience and uh, and wisdom. I know you're trans transferring from old to new, but if you could look back uh, a little bit, the conventional wisdom in in all of this seems to be that if you've got a good idea, you'll win. And but what you need is intellectual property. Uh, uh, protection, you need some coaching uh, on the new business, you need um, talented people, which are, are abundant here. Uh, but the conventional wisdom also is, but if you really want to fund this, go to New York, Chicago, Minneapolis, or California, that it's a dead end in Wisconsin. I mean, that seems to be the conventional wisdom. Uh, do you want to comment? On yeah. I mean, I don't want to sugarcoat it. Money is always an issue here, and seed money to get projects started. Uh, is still very critical in Wisconsin. Um, and we do need to really explore how we can increase the seed money to get these good ideas launched. Um, it is something that uh, the Research to Jobs Committee is looking for. I do think that the whole culture issue of entrepreneurism, the thing that Kim is doing and that workforce development is doing, is really important. And we've been doing a lot of work on here at campus uh, to get that going. And I also believe that really the students are going to have some great ideas. I had a young student come in recently who was a graduate of the Weiner Center here. Uh, he, uh, he's you know, running two jobs right now. He's, got, he's uh, bought the, uh, the, rental, uh, uh, the boat rental business at uh, Wingra, Lake Wingra and at Vilas. He runs that. He makes money on it. Uh, and then he's now started a medical device company. And he's got some plans to do it, so, I mean, he is able to do it, but it is um, a continual issue with the startups that come through us, is how are we going to get the seed money to get this thing launched? Um, I've always felt that uh, the technology that we've got in Wisconsin and the uh, employees that we've got in Wisconsin for venture capital 
uh, firms is like shooting fish in a barrel, but it's really tough to get them to come here. Um, we have uh, a few good venture firms in the state, but we could use a dozen more. And so that is a challenge. I think some of the things the governor uh, is doing with the, the tax credits and the Wisconsin Technology Council's work with angel investors has been uh, terrific. I mean, we are really doing a good job in the state with angel investing, um, but we could use more venture money. Other questions, comments? Observations about the policy questions that Vice President Martin has put on the screen? Well, people are thinking, uh, President Pruitt, let me say that I hope that the presentations this morning have given us all a sense of the incredible range of workforce development activities that the university, our campus extension system are directly involved in. It really does run the gamut from A to Z, and I think sometimes the impression is the university leans back and lets others do this work. We work with all sorts of partners to get this done, but we are involved at just about every level of workforce development now, and I think we'll need to be even more in the future. Bridget Davis. Um, thinking of all of the policy questions sort of together and in terms of our role and what have you, and one of the things that I have learned as a result of these presentations is that there is um, some really good news in, in so far as there's tons of examples of collaboration going on across systems and agencies and what have you. I would say that in answer to how we can expand, how we can be more impactful, which is kind of a theme across the three sets of policy questions, is continually being more um, intentional about those collapse such that, you know, when new things get launched or what have you, a check goes, you know, as part of a process that says, you know, have we done our very best to make sure that we've communicated and collaborated with whomever. You know, just, just because I, I'm, I'm wanting to recognize that we're making progress, but I also know that there is, when I think about what the average person on the street who could benefit from any of this would, would say, they'd say, you know, it's just so complicated, I don't know how to, you know what I mean? And a lot of these systems have very good systems of communicating to the people who are, you know, who are recipients. So I would say one thing we can do is to be even more diligent and intentional about our uh, commitment to the collaboration part of it. Just as Bridget Crane. I have no idea how to answer this question, but I certainly want to hear some thoughts about the first question. Uh, what is the answer to that? <laughs> well, I think we're working on the answer, um, but I think that it is doable. I'm really optimistic in this state. Um, we expect that, uh, you know, we're looking at where the state is going with respect to its focus. We have, for instance, a bioenergy initiative, $125 million from the Department of Energy. And we know more money is going to be coming down the road. This is going to create jobs. Um, that it, it's an enormous program um, at Madison. It's a program that's going to reach throughout the state to figure out how we can use our agricultural resources to create energy. Um, Chris, was over, uh, uh, Chris Andrews was over visiting uh, with me yesterday about clean tech programs uh, that can bring uh, both visitors and dollars into the state to learn how Madison uh, and uh, Sheboygan and Green Bay and uh, the rest of the state deals with our water issues uh, because uh, we're doing it relatively well here. We can always do it better, but this is technology that we can help uh, generate jobs in Wisconsin for. So I think we are, when you look at what the uh, federal uh, government's uh, focus is going forward, I think Wisconsin is in a pretty good position and we are going to create jobs out of that. So I'm very optimistic about what's going on. Let me, I, I want to just invite a if any of the chancellors had any thoughts or comments either on this question or any others, you should certainly feel free to offer them at any point in time. Uh, Regent Bartel. I have a question uh, relating to um, our undergraduate uh, uh, offerings, course offerings. And on this subject, because I'm having difficulty reconciling a conflict 
um, between the objective of educating our students on general knowledge, values, <coughs> how to be a good global citizen and so forth, with the objective of providing more technical, practical information that leads to, uh, that leads to jobs, leads to a, a career in research. And, and what does this suggest to, uh, regarding our uh, course offerings at the undergraduate level? Well, I think, first of all, the, um, the, the set of values that you articulated first, which we would call coming out of the LEAP work right. that we're doing, the liberal education, really are the underpinning of all of our degrees. Whether you are getting a bachelor's degree in history or you're getting a bachelor's degree in nursing, you, you still need to be coming out with you know, critical thinking and global citizenship and social responsibility and all those other things that we've said underpin all of the work that we do. And in fact, if you look at the, um, both the accreditation requirements and, and the, that employment data, that's what they say to us. They say, yes, we want the person who, who, we may want somebody that has a set of technical skills, but we want them to be baccalaureate prepared because we know then they will come with all of these other things. And that's really the value added that comes with the baccalaureate degree. So while we do have a number of programs that are aimed at particular professional studies, they also have a very strong liberal education component. And can they get that in in four years or even five years? Yes, they years? can. If I can just uh, kind of bring it to the street level on the research at the university on the bioenergy and how it hits the workforce is we have two paper companies and we know that we've been shedding paper job paper company jobs for probably the last two decades and if we can develop a biofuel based off the, the excess of the paper products and then bring that into a fuel and make that plant more efficient, but also then have an export for that company that they can export to a energy company. That actually saves those jobs, which aren't university jobs, but they're real street jobs. And that's an important connection that the UW system allows us to have um, with the technologies and transferring into the workplace. I might make one comment, Mr. President. If you, if you turn to page 34 of the slides uh, that you have in your packet, it's Carl's Wharf Home Runs list. And uh, you'll notice in 2003 there's one called Diffusion Barrier, and the PI is Wiley. Um, and that former Chancellor John Wiley, who was a colleague uh, in the uh, uh, electrical engineering department, uh, invented a, a technology, an item that was placed in uh, some uh, commercialized technologies, and I think 2003 was when we won the lawsuit that said those companies have to recognize that invention and pay us for it. And uh, uh, I saw Sandy Wilcox uh, of the UW Foundation shortly after we won the case, and he said to me, you know, I, I used to think of John Wiley just as a chancellor, and now he's a prospect. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, comments? So I just want to underscore one thing about that home run list. You know, when I talk about that, those home runs brought, brought a lot of resources back to the other hands. But equally important, they improved a lot of lives. So if you go through that, uh, these technologies that are help patients, uh, even the diffusion barrier has made our life easier with respect to increasing um, productivity, Well, that's maybe a great place to end this conversation. Thank you very much, President. Thank you. Thank you. We are going to uh, be adjourned and eat lunch. Thank you. What night?